The subject we just finished with was harmonies, and many, many early students feel that they need to understand harmonies before they really understand color. But actually, harmonies are somewhat backwards-looking things. They are after the fact. We can look at something, analyze it, and say, oh, look, the colors are used like this. But harmonies are not a starting point. Harmonies are really not so much how you, how you plan a painting all the time. Harmonies are almost like the tubes of paint you pull out of your paint box, but they don't guarantee what you're going to get. Contrast, though, are compositional tools. And there are seven that we have generally come to, to agree on in art schools for a little less than the last 100 years. Contrast of value being the first. Contrast are compositional tools. Harmonies are not. Contrast are what allows you to think about how to create relationships between colors, and they are actually much more important to understand than harmonies. And they're not hard to understand either. They're very easy to understand. We get our idea of what contrasts are from a teacher at the Bauhaus named Johannes Itten, who actually took, took these same ideas from his early teacher who had not published them. We sent, tend to center on seven. Some of them, like contrast of value, seem like, well, we know that. We know, of course, the con the, uh, we know how value contrast works, but without it, we couldn't use color. We, knew, we need contrast of value. So in this, these cases, not unlike when I was just simply trying to explain to you what value is, we look at, at what is most important because of the strong value differences, because of the very strong high contrast edges. The edges give us our sense of what these paintings are. And in fact, this seems like a very important uh, tr angle. Uh, because her skin is so light looking, which would, would have been favored at that time, and everything else is so dark that she seems to almost be, be luminous. Well, that's not accidental. Uh, we remember this, not as a color painting, although Sargent was a, a wonderful colorist, but we remember this as a, a form-based painting because value helps us see where form is. Color does not do it in the same way, although it does do it to some degree. In this case, you were looking at a picture of a large piece of cloth that is actually meant to be a large piece of cloth, not something small like a napkin. And by now you may have noticed that there is a girl behind this cloth. You looked at the cloth first. You're supposed to. It's supposed to look like a picture of cloth. That's your first reading. The girl is your secondary reading. I don't think there's, there may be a tertiary reading of her stepping on flowers, but I doubt if that's very important. Why this was seen as a subject for, for painting is the dark and light value. It was not because, oh, I've got to capture the colors of this. It is more like these are very strong forms and they're strong forms seen at noon when which the light is brightest. So you're going to get the strongest kind of, of edges and contours that you can because of noon. More of the same. Again, this is a light form against a dark background. So is this, I think that uh, the photographer who did this actually had some light seepage over here, so that that's affecting us. But most of this is based really on value more than anything else. The same thing is true here. It helps us see these forms. We don't look at this as a landscape. We don't look at this as an architectural painting or as a painting of trees. We think of this as a painting of turkeys. It's called turkeys. And they stand out to us because they are so light against such a dark foreground. Shadows too. Shadows are, are a big deal that we, uh, we can play with, with dark light contrast. Now what was not so apparent right away in this painting is light coming through this glass of wine on this wall actually gives us uh, another level of information here. But we actually don't look at our main characters first, we look at the shadows first because that's so light and that's so dark that it draws our eye faster than anything else in the image. This is a double complementary harmony. You can see the orange of the dog and the blue of the sky, the red of the dress and the green of the trees. So two, two pair of complements. But now that it's been up on, on the screen for about 30 seconds, you may have noticed that her head, her profile head, is delineated by an almost artificial sense of brightness around it, like there is a halo, and she is a dark silhouette in there. That dark light contrast is why you look there, and that actually is a very important part of this painting. It's really not about texture as much as it is about that silhouette. Uh, Winslow Homer's early evening painting uh, is set against a, a bit of brightness. Now, that brightness could be, if we were looking down, but we're not, 
uh, light reflecting off of water, but actually we're looking up at the sky, and that is where you're going to see dark light contrast used so often as silhouettes against a very light background, which is most often going to be the sky as a light background. Uh, I showed you an image of Petra a little earlier, and this works the same way, that the lightness of the sky is what is remarkable here. And then, eventually, you notice the trees, and in a tertiary way, you finally notice the people here. But this was the big impact, and this carries a spectrum. This goes from red to orange to yellow to not much green, really, but sort of to a blue-green. doesn't get the violet, though. In this case, we have artificial lights that are, are more often than not going to be warm, especially for the, for if they're from an incandescent light source, which gives off heat. Uh, the lights are going to be warm, and they're seen lit against a night sky, so we have a cool and warm uh, involved. But it is the light against darkness that makes this the composition that it is. So is this. Why this, again, was chosen as a scene to paint is the lovely light blossoms here, which miraculously have n none of which have fallen onto the ground at this point, uh, and, and a dark foreground. Contrast of hue is not exactly what it sounds like. Contrast of hue means look at all the colors, as silly as that sounds. In contrast of hue, um, your point is to overwhelm the viewer with as many different co colors as possible and almost try as hard as you can to never put similar colors next to each other. You're trying for the greatest variety possible in colors. It's actually a chaotic way of creating a composition. There are current day painters who use it once in a while, but it does tend to challenge form. It tends to make you confused about, am I supposed to look at the individual spots of color or am I supposed to look at shapes? Uh, Raphael certainly used this a great deal, and his predecessors in the Middle Ages used this. Uh, people who did uh, manuscript illumination, people who painted in books uh, before printing presses, uh, also tried to make uh, all the colors look as bright as possible, and one way to do that is make sure they all look as different as possible, so you don't put too many similar colors next to each other. Well, these are amazingly bright colors, um, and looking at it, it's hard to actually even find the people because the colors are overwhelming you and the colors are the point. If I take the colors out, if I take the human saturation out, we actually have a seething mass of flesh and fabric now. We have lost all composition. If you blur your eyes, it's hard to find people. But if I bring back the colors, you now are reminded of why this was painted this way. It is supposed to dazzle you with all those colors. And so is this. Um, now, there are more things going on than this. Uh, a yellow character in medieval paintings was always a derided character. Uh, and this person is being beaten up. Uh, in medieval paintings, almost every time somebody's wearing yellow, and especially if it's yellow and black, um, they are meant to be made fun of or uh, dismissed as, as unimportant characters. This very, very old painting, every single color you see is never put next to anything very much like it. So, well, with maybe the exception of, of this light red and this darker red, but I've got a red and a green, a yellow and a green, just a red, uh, a soft blue and a red, a violet and a red, and a green and a red. Green, by the way, was actually a very difficult color for, for painters long ago, and so was blue. Uh, it's more recently that we have a, a larger grouping of them. Obviously, everything here is also supposed to be a very different color. Uh, it almost looks like the person only had yellow, green, red, and blue to work with and did not want to use anything else. That's not really the case, though. Uh, in this case, every single person, they weren't really that wealthy, uh, is seen wearing a radically different color. So every single person is meant to have their own identity and their own place in this particular narrative. Even more true here, and very similar narrative too. Um, this is surprising in that we have RGB colors in here, and we don't really see that in a lot of older paintings. But one of the surprises is the, the very large range of colors, and they're not found in complexion, they're not found in lighting effects, they're not found in foliage or landscape, they're found in fabric. Uh, Raphael continued to work this way. Uh, he just simply hit, made his darks darker and he started using a single point light source more often uh, in his later, later paintings. 
Um, early Renaissance uh, followed some of the same habits as medieval painters. Color was not meant to reproduce nature, although the Renaissance is where we actually start wondering if that's the right way to work and we start trying to reproduce nature. Uh, color is meant to show off your mastery of creating things you take from the ground, refine and display as color. More of the same. And again, you don't have a group of people all wearing blue standing next to each other. In every case, you have people wearing different colors put next to each other. Well, when people did still lives, they did the same thing. You didn't really see blue next to blue green very often, for instance. You would see different colors placed next to each other. And the entire large um, genre of flower paintings like this uh, has a lot to do with showing off that mastery of very, very bright colors and they get brighter and brighter very often as the years go on till we reach points like this where they're just getting practically fluorescent. This is also a little bit more contemporary. In this case we have a lot of bright colors very much like the flowers but with another cultural attribute and that is abundance. A great deal of colors tends to point towards the idea of abundance that you have so much variety of things that you will not really be suffering. The same is true here. Uh, still life of dessert, which is mainly made of fruit. Abundance again, but quite not quite the same thing. Uh, before you would paint abundance, many hundreds of years ago, you would paint abundance in a way to show off, uh, to brag that you, you can afford all this. Uh, in this case, it's more of a study of uh, distinguished color, colors that are all different from one another. So uh, this does not really share this and does not even share brushstroke quality. Every single one of these is seen to be a different painting problem. We've talked about this one before, but it is a wide variety of colors. They are unified by sunset light, as I mentioned before. So the redness actually does tend to make this a bit more unified. In this case, and this is more unusual, we have a lot of color going on. We have blue violets and red oranges and yellows and greens and some blues in the background. Not such strong reds and, and no red, vi red violets. This, this may be blue violets. I have some purples in here. But notice they're all the same value. I'm not going to make this into a grayscale like before. You would actually lose all the information though if I did because there are no dark edges except for these silhouetted trees to really help you distinguish things. Some of that's true here, and some of that is the joy of, of, of an image like this, in which dappled light is uh, letting you see all the flowers and all the different colors of people's clothing, and it's meant to be almost like, like going into a, an old part of a city with neon lights. It is meant to be dazzling. It's meant to distract you, as this does. Uh, I'm not going to pretend that this is as successful a painting as some of them that I've shown you. Color is not helping us find our way around this painting. We've actually got to study this a little bit to figure out where we are. But notice we have a yellow dress and a red dress and a green dress and a blue violet dress and a blue green dress. These five characters are supposed to be distinguished from each other, but the values are not distinguished. So they tend to blend into each other because value is such an important thing to look at. This is a big surprise. Um, fishing village at dusk, fishing, vi fishing village at dusk, excuse me. Um, we have more colors than we would normally expect to see. This looks like it was possibly influenced by Fauves, by the Fauve movement, but I'm not going to say that that's true. Um, it is more color than we expect to see, and I'm personally charmed by it because of that. This looks like a, uh, an example of dominance of hue. This actually looks like red varnish has turned redder and uh, has made this a little bit duller than it's meant to be, except for this. This is meant to be white and that's meant to be the blue of the sky and that's actually accurate and there's no varnish making that more yellow so this is probably what it was meant to be. You would see an image like this when you, there's more moisture or atmosphere in the air, the more, more water vapor uh, and if, the, if there's even more water vapor we're going to get more blue in the background for atmospheric perspective. Uh, a similar type of attempt, similar kinds of value relationships, but now we have dappled light of very light and dark color. We also have a very distinctive light source coming in from the left. That was true in the last painting, but not in the kind of high contrast that you're looking at now. This is also a double complementary painting. 